This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on quantitative methods and the reading on time value of money, which simply means that money accumulates value over time. And I'm guessing that you learned this way back in kindergarten, that if you saved an amount today and you invested it in a financial asset that had a positive rate of return, that at some time in the future, you would have a larger amount. And that's really the concept of time value of money. This is known as compounding into the future. And you'll see uh, that point as I take you through some of these learning outcome statements. Now, notice that the action words uh, ask us to interpret, explain, and demonstrate. So those are important LOSs. In fact, I think the first two are probably uh, super important because we need to figure out the components of a given interest rate. We need to interpret those different types of interest rate, and then we need to use a timeline. But the challenge will be uh, for those of you who have not used a financial calculator in several years to re-familiarize yourself with the calculator. For those of you who've never used a financial calculator, uh, it's your challenge to kind of figure it out. And that's what I will do for both uh, sets of candidates here. We'll work through some problems so that we can and look at those middle LOSs, calculate, 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 and we'll do things like future value and present value. We'll go ahead and solve for the interest rate and we'll view some problems that have different frequencies of compounding. And that'll take us through those LOSs. And let me just remind you that any LOS is fair game for a question on the exam. So let's start with a basic question. If I gave you a choice between uh, a receiving $1,000 today and receiving $1,000 in five years, this is really a no-brainer, right? You'd say, hey, Jim, let me have that $1,000 today. And I might ask you, I might say, hey, tell me why you want that $1,000 today. And some students answer that question. They'll say, well, I want it so that I can spend it. And some students say, well, I want it today so I can spend it because prices might rise in the future. And so those are two pretty okay answers, but still, in the absence of inflation, you'd still rather have that $1,000 today because you can invest it. And as long as the interest rate is positive, after five years, you're gonna have, boy, dare I say it, way more than $1,000 in five years. And so this is really uh, the basis of this concept called time value of money, because a dollar day today is, that is received today is worth more. In fact, some would argue that it's worth way more than, a, than an identical amount received sometime in the future. Now look at that last embedded circle point that we've written down there. And this is an interesting kind of an addition to our understanding of time value of money. It allows you the opportunity to postpone consumption and earn interest. And this is going to be super important when we when we go through, here, let me go back here quickly. When we go through that second LOS and we divide an interest rate into its components. But let's start with a super simple example. Let's consider an investor with $100 today. And this investor hopes to purchase an asset one year from today. Now, if that savings rate is 10%, the $100 savings, that initial savings will grow to 110, right? That's an obvious answer. Everybody I'm guessing that's watching this recording will know that 100 grows to 110. But what happens if those inputs are not quite so obvious? In other words, suppose I change that $100 today to $14,862 and the savings rate was 4.3467%. How much would that grow to after, uh, after one year? Well, my brain can't figure that out. Maybe you guys are smarter than I am and you can, you can figure it out. But let's go ahead and, and do some math here. At the risk of offending all of your historical mathematical knowledge, uh, bear with me as I go through what I call the old long way math. And by the way, that's that's Jim's term. That's not uh, that's not a CFA term. It's not really a finance term, and it's probably not even a math term. Uh, but you'll see what I mean here in just a second. So how would we do this? We would take the one hundred dollars, multiply it by 
10% and we would get $10 worth of interest on our initial investment. And then of course we would add the $100 initial investment to get the 110. But notice how inefficient that old long way math model is. We had to multiply and we had to add two mathematical functions. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could combine those two mathematical functions into one mathematical function? And that's of course what I'm calling the new short way math. And to do this, we're gonna use something that I call the time value factor. And I'll show you this equation in a later slide, but for now, just envision this time value factor as the number one plus the decimal form of the interest rate raised to the number of periods in the problem. So all we're gonna do in this new short way math is to take our original $100, multiply it by 1.10, raise that to the one power, and that gets us 110. And so clearly the new short way math is much more efficient than the old long way math. So let's make life even more interesting. Let's suppose that this investor is not going to make a purchase one year from today, but it's going to make a purchase two years from today. Now you might be tempted to say, wait a minute, Jim, this is super obvious. If we earn $10 worth of interest the first year, then we're going to earn $10 of interest in the second year. So you might be tempted to say that that future purchase amount is going to be $120, right? 10 in year one and 10 in year two. However, however, this ignores the value of compounding because what's going to happen is, of course, we're going to earn $10 in interest in that first year, but then we're going to earn interest on top of that $10 during the second year as well as another $10. So go ahead and work through the old long way math with me here uh, if you want to. Uh, so we're going to say 10% times 100. That gives me, that gives me the $10, right? Uh, add the $100 to it. That gives me 110. So now I multiply that 110 times the 10% and I get 11. Ah, there's that extra $1 of compounding on top of interest. <laughs> on top of principal or initial savings. Then multiply, I'm sorry, add that to the 110 and you get 121. So look, you might have been tempted to say 120 is the answer, but that's not correct because it ignores the value of compounding. And once again, this is the nature of time value of money. So that future purchase amount is going to be 121. So let's do the new short way math. Uh, down at the bottom. All I'm going to do is the same thing I did at the top. I'm going to take one plus the decimal form of the interest rate and I'm going to square it because it's two periods and that gets me my 121. All right, so what I want to do now is show you the financial calculator steps. All right, let me show you how to use a financial calculator to solve for the 110 and the 121. Now notice I have a financial calculator app opened in this slide deck. And I'm guessing that you guys notice that this is not the BA2 plus. Uh, it is a different kind of a calculator, but I just want to let you know that Texas Instruments does not have an app that can be used on a Mac. So I had to use this one here. If Texas Instruments were to have allowed me to uh, use the app here, I surely would have done it. But the inputs are identical, so we should be OK. So let me tell you a couple of things about this financial calculator. When you turn it on, you probably have two decimals. So I want to show you how to change that quickly. So we're going to do a second format. Notice it says decimals equals two. And I usually have three. So I'm just going to do, watch this, three. And then I'll come here and hit enter. So that changes my decimals to three. You can do four or five. Uh, I think it allows you to do seven or eight. I don't think it allows you to, to do nine or any number above, but. For those of you who feel like you need nine decimal places, uh, uh, probably you don't. Now, I also want to make sure that you do this. Hit your second 
P slash Y button. That needs to be at one payment per year. The default is 12. So just go ahead and hit, uh, so whatever you have there, do a one and then hit enter and then that should be fine. So that's how you wanna set your payments per year so that we compound annually and we'll make some slight adjustments to that as we go through. All right, so you ready for this? So let's do, let's get our 110 here as our first result. So what we're gonna do is we're going to hit the number first and then we're gonna hit one of these five time value of money buttons that are in the third row. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna input four of them and then solve for the fifth. It doesn't matter the order of the inputs, but of course it matters which one you're solving for. So you wanna follow along with me. So let's do 100 is our initial amount. We're gonna call that present value. We're gonna say 10%, so leave this in percent form. That's the I slash Y, which stands for interest per year. We did this over one period, so we're gonna make one N. Now we don't know anything about a payment, but do you remember that, oh, what was that, the fourth or so, maybe the fifth uh, LOS, uh, there was a phrase in there to solve for ordinary annuity and an annuity due. So that's gonna be our PMT. Uh, I always tell students, I say, hey, look for the ANN button on your calculator, which there is no ANN button. So the PMT button is the annuity button. So we're going to do, we don't know anything about that. So there's no payment. So we'll do that. And then you're tempted to just hit future value. Now, those of you uh, who have the HP calculator, you're going to do the same thing here. And all you have to do is hit your future value. But the Texas Instruments people, you see the CPT button. So you need to compute future value. And there is our 110. Notice it's a negative 110. And that's because you told the calculator that somebody gave you $100. We, had, we entered it as a plus, which means at the end of year one, you owe that person $110. And so uh, the calculator doesn't care whether you are the borrower or the lender. Time value of money applies equally to both sides of the contract. I will say that if, if we had entered that 100 as a minus, uh, input, then this future value would have been a positive 110. Now, let me show you something that's really cool with the calculator. If we want to do this second one back here, the 121, I can go, I can just say 2 is N, and then I can recompute future value, and there's, there's my 121. All right, let's move on to a series of time value of money questions, and I'll show you how to solve these super simple problems with the calculator. All right, you ready? So what did we do in the previous problem? We went from $100 today to 110 in the future and then 121 in the future. Well, not all time value of money problems are, let's solve for that future amount. We call that future value. Sometimes we wanna solve for present value. Sometimes we wanna solve for the interest rate Sometimes we want to solve for the payment of the PMT. So let's go ahead and take a look at these five problems here. Once again, these are really simple problems, uh, problems that you should be able to get using the old math that I described to you earlier. But let's go ahead and do this with our financial calculator. All right, notice that I have the question stem in black and I have the input solution in red. So let's go ahead and do these as quickly as we can. And feel free to stop and practice this on your own. Bob saves 500 today. Compute the value of the savings in five years if the relevant interest rate is 7%. All right. So this is, we're going to say 500 is being saved today. So that's a present value. And notice how cool the uh, Texas Instruments uh, operates. It, it tells you what you just inputted there. Now, remember, you don't have to clear anything, so we'll just go to the next step. So we'll say 5 is N over that time period, and we'll say 7 is the interest rate. And we don't know anything about payment yet. We'll do that here in just a second. And then we're going to solve for future value. So we're going to do compute future value. There's our 701. And then I'll go ahead and go clear this. So Betty 
uh, needs a thousand in 11 years. What do we have to save today? Ah, now we're given, we're given that future value. And then we need to figure out uh, what the goal is, how much must be saved today. All right, so all we're gonna do, and notice I kind of broke up the order here just to prove to you that there's no, uh, no, no reason for you to continue or to believe that you need to put these in some exact order. The inputs don't matter. The order of the inputs don't matter, I should say. That the actual input matters, but the order doesn't. So let's do uh, 11 is n and nine is I, zero is payment. We'll do something with a payment in a little bit. Thousand is future value. And so all we're gonna do is hit compute present value. And there's our 387. You getting the hang of this now with your calculators. All right, Bill has 49 today and needs 92 in six years. Ah. This is super important here. So let me go down and clear this. Remember when we did our very first calculation, we entered 100 and our answer was a minus 110. So when we're solving for the interest rate, we need to be super sensitive about positivity and negativity. So watch what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna say, uh, what does Bill start with 49 and I'll make it negative. So hit the plus minus button. Don't hit the minus sign there, hit the plus minus. So what is that? That's present value. And then 92 is future value. 6 is N. And 0 is payment. And we're going to compute I. So there's our 11.07. Now think about it. If you, if you leave the 49 positive and the 92 positive, you'll get the calculator will say uh, no solution. The calculator will say, wait a minute, you told us that somebody gave you $49. And then sometime later, somebody gave you $92. There is no interest rate that links those two positive cash flows. So this is what I tell students all the time. I want you guys to take out your pencil and I want you to write this down. When solving for the interest rate, comma, make present value negative. Now you could make present value or future value negative, it doesn't matter, but there's gonna be a time when we do some capital budgeting problems where we're going to have to make present value negative. So you might as well just get in the habit of making present value negative. All right, uh, let's see. Bonnie promises to pay uh, 200 per year for eight years, uh, beginning one year from today. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at this 200 per year, every year for eight years. That's our definition of an annuity, a series of consecutive equal payments that begin one year from today. That's an ordinary annuity, and that's going to be the PMT button on the calculator. You might think to yourself, hey, I wish I could cross off the PMT and put A and N on there, and that's, that's, an, that's an okay thought process. But we're gonna solve this the same way that we've always done. So we're gonna say, since nothing happens today, we'll say zero is present value. We'll say eight is N. We'll say 11 is I. And we'll say 200 is now payment. And we want to know how much this is going to be worth at some time in the future. 2371. Let's go ahead and solve one final problem. Bruce has 9,000 today, promises to pay his sons every year for seven years, compute the annuity. Oh, so now we're solving for that PMT, we're solving for the annuity. So we're just gonna do 9,000 is present value. <clears throat> Seven is N, three is the interest rate, zero is future value, solve for payment. And there's our 14, 44, 55. So hopefully you get the sense of you're entering four variables and you're solving for the fifth one. And the fifth one could be future value. It could be present value. It could be the interest rate. Make sure you're sensitive to positivity and negativity there. It could be payment. And what I didn't go through was a problem to solve for N, but we could have done that as well. All right, those simple examples kind of gave us a good sense of 
the concept of time value of money. And notice that in four of those problems, we were given an interest rate. And in one of those problems, we had to solve for it. And so let's go ahead and specifically address this LOS. Although I've kind of hinted at it throughout the first couple of minutes of this slide deck. Notice we're asked to interpret the interest rate as, all right, a required rate of return. So I want you to think of uh, this required return as you and I enter a contract. And it could be as simple as that very first example where we had $100 today and $110 a year from now. And so you and I agree to make that exchange. Doesn't matter which direction they flow initially or at the end. And so what's happening here is that the lender is saying something like, let's suppose I'm lending you that $100. The lender is saying something like, hey, I'm requiring 10%. In other words, I'm going to lend you that $100 and I'm going to demand, I'm going to require you pay me that 10%, which would give me $110 a year from now. But from your perspective, what you're thinking is, okay, I'm borrowing this $100 from Jim. What am I going to do with it? Well, I need to do something more with it than 10% because I need to invest it at a minimum of 10% in order to satisfy my contract with Jim. So what does this read? The minimum rate of return an investor must receive in order to accept an investment. So we can view that from my perspective too. That 10% is, hey, you better do something with it. I don't care what you do with it, but you better at least get 10% because I want my $110 uh, a year from now. Now, it's also used and interpreted as this term, a discount rate. This is a generic term that is used in time value of money and other applications that we'll get to in uh, fu future readings in which we need an interest rate to discount future cash flows back to the present. And now the third interpretation is something like, okay, if I lend you that $100 today for one year, uh, what am I thinking? I'm thinking, well, I sure hope a really super profitable opportunity doesn't come by over the next year because I'm going to lament the fact that I lent you that $100 and all I asked for was 10%. Suppose somebody comes to me next month or in six months and says, hey, Jim, do you have $100? I have this great opportunity. We can double our money. <laughs> you know, let's forget about the legality of it or, or the ethics of it. I, and so I'm going to think to myself, oh, my gosh, I wish I didn't lend that $100 out because I might have something else in the future. So look at this opportunity cost. You know this from, um, from your economics days. The value of the best foregone alternative. Uh, and the interesting thing about this foregone alternative is that you may or may not know what that is today. But we'll talk about that at some time in the future. All right, so be able to answer uh, an LO, uh, a question on the exam that addresses this LOS, required rate of return, discount rate, and opportunity cost. Now, which brings us to the second LOS, which I think is a really super cool one. If I were creating exams, I would, I would craft a, a handful of questions relating to explain an interest rate as the sum of a real risk-free rate and premiums. Uh, that investors require as compensation for bearing, are you ready for this, distinct types of risk. All right, so look inside the gray box here. Real risk-free rate, plus, 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 plus. So we have a bunch of things in there. Now, there's irony in life and there's coincidence in life. I just gave this lecture to my students uh, uh, yesterday. It's an undergraduate financial institutions class. And so we talked about this exact uh, LOS. So what I want to do uh, over the next couple of minutes is I want to go ahead and give you that quick lecture. And I want to refer back to uh, our original interest rate, like 10%. So when I gave you that 10% interest rate on that very first slide, we didn't ask the question, where did it come from, right? I just made it up. Jim just made it up, pulled it right out of the air. But what we want to do is we want to divide that interest rate, which was 10% in my example, could have been 8%, could have been 12%, could have been 2%. We want to break that up into its component parts. 
So notice that we have five of them here. So this is, this is essentially five really good exam questions. So let's start with this concept of a real risk-free interest rate. And I want to address the risk-free component of it first. So let's suppose that I come to you and I say, I want two loans. I want a $50,000 loan and I'll pay you back in a month. But I also want another $50,000 loan and I'll pay you back in one year. So we have two loans, identical amounts, both the same borrower, but two time periods. All right. So I want to talk about this risk-free component first. So you're going to say to me, all right, Jim, I have $100,000 way over here and I'm happy to lend it to you, but what do I get out of it? And before I start answering that question, I reach into my pocket and I say, how about if I give you this as collateral? And this as collateral is the Pink Panther Diamond. Now, those of you who are old enough to have watched the old Peter Sellers Pink Panther movies will know that they are super funny. Those of you who are young enough to have watched the Steve Martin Pink Panther movies will know that those are extremely funny. So that's your homework assignment. When you have a free moment, go watch, uh, go watch those movies. But anyway, those of you who've watched those movies know that the Pink Panther diamond is priceless. So if I use that as collateral, in the signing of this contract, right? $50,000 loan here, $50,000 loan here. You're going to accept that as collateral because it turns it into a risk-free proposition. Now, of course, when we sign this contract, I'm going to say, look, when I, when I repay you all of your capital and your interest, I want, I want my Pink Panther Diamond back. All right. So uh, I'm going to prevent you from taking that Pink Panther Diamond and selling it over there, or I'm going to prevent you from rehypothecating that Pink Panther Diamond so that you can't use it collateral for your own, for your own uh, uh, borrowings. So I want you to think about that. There's no chance that you're not going to get your $100,000 plus interest back because you have this as collateral. Now, I want to address the real component of this. And to do the real component of the real risk-free interest rate, I also have to consider the conversation of inflation. So real, a real interest rate, whether it's risk-free or not, a real interest rate means a compensation for the change in your status in life over time, all right? So you want to be better off. Think of real as a measure of the improvement in the quality of your life. So let's think about this. Let's suppose that uh, a loaf of bread costs a dollar today. And you expect a loaf of bread to cost a dollar ten a year from now. Well, clearly, uh, clearly the change in the value of a loaf of bread, let's call that the change in the price of a loaf of bread, let's call that the rate of inflation of a loaf of bread is, is 10%. Well, if you lend me my capital and just charge me 10%, then you're no better off a year from now than you were today. You can still buy just a loaf of bread. So the real risk-free rate of interest tells us how much better off you want to be in the absence of inflation. And then, of course, we have to add an inflation component. So the real risk-free rate of interest is the starting point Plus, you want protection against that rate of inflation. So you might charge me 2% real rate, and then you might charge me 10% because inflation is 10%. So if we add real plus inflation, you might charge me 12%. So that gives you a real return, plus it protects you against inflation. Hopefully that makes perfect sense. But then what you're going to do is add a couple of other premiums or premia, depending on which word you prefer, uh, to your nominal interest rate that you're going to charge me. You're going to charge me a default risk premium. So you're going to look at me and you're going to say, all right, Jim, uh, what do your assets look like? 
Um, what does your mortgage payment and car payment look like? Uh, how much money do you make? What kind of income do you have outside of your college teaching job? So you're going to do a credit analysis on me. And so you're going to add a default risk premium. Maybe it's 3%, right? So where are we? You're going to charge me. You're going to charge me 2% for the real rate. You're going to charge me 10% for inflation. You're going to charge me 2% for default. So now we're up to 15%. But notice we have some more plus signs. We're going to add a liquidity premium. So here's where we get a differential between the one month loan and the one year loan. All right. And this has a lot to do with that opportunity cost conversation that we just had a moment or two ago. So I want you to think about this. You're going to be without $50,000 for one month on that first loan. You're going to be without that $50,000 for one year on that second loan. So you are giving up liquidity. You are giving up access to that $50,000 for a month and $50,000 for a year. So you're going to charge me a liquidity premium for giving up that liquidity, the access to that capital. But here's the thing. You might charge me 1% for the one month loan and you might charge me 4% for the one year loan. So now we're up to 16% or 19%. Ah, do you see how cool this is? We're arriving at different interest rates for different time periods. And then we're going to add a final maturity premium, which might sound a little bit like the liquidity premium, but it has its own subtleties. You're going to charge me less for the one month loan on this liquidity premium than you will on the one year loan because you ready for this? Let's suppose that over the next uh, week or two that you want your money back. And so you go to the secondary market and you try to sell your loan. Well, you're going to be able to sell your one month loan for a much higher price than you will receive for the 12 month loan. That's the maturity risk premium. The fact that you're at risk and the risk is largely due to changes in interest rates. So notice in the end, you might charge me, boy, I'm going to make up some numbers here. You might charge me 20% for the one month loan and 24% for the one year loan based on these five factors. So let's go ahead and look at these embedded circle points. The real risk-free rate is the single period interest rate for a completely risk-free security if no inflation was expected. All right, that makes perfect sense. My Pink Panther Diamond makes that a risk-free security. Now, of course, I'd probably be a nut to who hand over the Pink Panther priceless diamond to you as collateral for this. I'd probably go to a bank or something and, and I'd probably want to keep the Pink Panther Diamond in a safe deposit box or someplace safe. But anyway, the key point is no inflation. So then we add an expected inflation premium to that, right? And then we add a default risk premium. Let me go ahead and read that. The possibility that Jim will fail to make a promise payment at the contracted time and in the contracted amount. So there is default risk on this because I may not pay you. Now, of course, there is default risk even though you're holding this collateral because when I do pay you, you have to you have to turn that collateral back to me. We're going to add a liquidity, a liquidity premium. Notice in bold we have if the investment needs to be converted to cash quickly. That's what I was saying to you about selling it. And then the maturity premium accounts for additional risks uh, for the longer time to maturity. All right, moving on to calculate and interpret the effective annual interest rate uh, given a stated annual interest rate and the frequency of compounding. So let's go ahead and introduce this concept of, hey, sometimes the banker is going to pay you interest that's compounded every year. But the banker doesn't have to pay you interest compounded annually. The banker could pay you every six months or every four months, or every month, or every week, or could pay you every third Monday, or every third month. I mean, the banker could offer interest uh, over any time period that he or she, or she chooses. 
But what we need to do is we need to convert something like that into what we call an effective annual interest rate. So there are two equations there that you probably should memorize. And of course, as we always do here in these slide decks, we try to give you a good example. So you ready for this? Suppose we're given a stated interest rate of 10%. So the nominal interest rate, the stated interest rate, is almost always given to you as an annual number. And then in parentheses, or as we have here, comma, compounded quarterly, here is what we get for the uh, EAR. So we're gonna take that, here, you ready for this? That time value factor that I explained to you before, right? It was one plus the decimal form of the interest rate. So in that first slide, we had 1.10. But now we're chopping that 10% into four different time periods. Three months, then three months, then three months, then three months. So what we need to do is we need to divide that decimal form of the interest rate by four. So it's one plus, 0 0.10 divided by four, and then we're gonna re-raise it to the four time periods because we're compounding quarterly. Subtract out the one, and there we get the 10.38% effective annual rate. So here's our calculate the effective annual rate. So there we do that quarterly, and notice what we give it to you here. Let's suppose we do it monthly. We just divide by 12, raise it to the 12, and of course, we're gonna get a higher uh, EAR 10.47 versus 10.38 versus the 10% stated or the nominal annual interest rate. So look at the look at the two arrow points at the bottom and notice that we have bolded this. The more frequent the frequency of compounding, the higher is going to be the effective annual rate. Now, here's this slide that I was telling you about earlier. This is the, uh, this is the financial mathematic formula that I was describing to you just a few moments ago. So here we go, ready? Future value is equal to present value times one plus R, one plus the interest rate. And remember, and see you guys know this at this point, that R is the decimal form of the interest rate, and we're gonna raise it to the n power. So this is the process of compounding. Notice that equation there. We're taking a present value, we're multiplying it by one plus a positive interest rate, so we're just making it bigger as we go out into the future. And so, right, this is what you wanna do, this is what I wanna do. I want to save an amount today, right? Let's suppose it's 100,000, and I wanna retire in, oh, let's say 40 years, and I wanna earn 10%, so I wanna retire with, you know, a billion dollars, and this is the value Value of compounding. We're taking an initial savings amount and we're making it bigger in the future. Now, of course, let's go ahead and stand on our heads. You ready? Let's stand on our heads. Let's take that top equation and instead of solving for future value, let's go ahead and solve for present value. So you do some quick algebra. I think that's called cross multiplication. And you arrive at present value is equal to future value divided by that time value factor. And so those are two super critical formulas that provide the fundamental support for the financial calculator, right? Here's, here's my, can you guys see my calculator? So we're using those five time value of money buttons and the calculator is programmed to use those handful of equations. Here, let me put this one up. I love this calculator here. This is my favorite calculator of all times. I carry both of them. My family thinks that I'm, uh, a little bit of an oddball, but uh, I don't go anywhere without my financial calculators in case someone pops up and say, hey, Jim, solve this problem for me. Now, of course, um, the LOS asks us to worry about different compounding periods, so we need to make the adjustment. And so the adjustment is here. Let me go back here to present value. So look at that. And if we're compounding over multiple periods during the year, we need to worry about the N right? And we need to worry about the R. And so here's what we do. So all we do is take the R divided by the M, right? And then the M times the end. And so this is going to be able to identify for us different compounding periods. All right, you ready for this? Suppose that you need $10,000 in your savings account at the end 
uh, of year three, right? So that's a future value. But the account offers a return of 10% per year. So if we stopped right there, if we stopped right there, we would just enter those thing, those inputs just like we did before. 10,000 would be future value, uh, N would be three, 10 would be I, zero would be payment, and we would solve for present value, right? But now notice that we have this extra thing in there, compounded quarterly. All right, so how are we gonna do this? All right, so let's go ahead and look at a timeline. And this helps us with our, our final LOS. Let's go ahead and look at a timeline. So notice we have zero and then one, two, three, but instead of a one, two, three, we have four quarters, eight quarters, and 12 quarters. So this is what we need. We need 10,000 at the end of year three. How much would we need to save today in order to solve that problem? And so there's our good old formula. Uh, 74.35 and notice the adjustments that we make in the denominator because what we're doing is we're saying boy we're not getting 10 percent every quarter right we're only getting 10 divided by 4 every quarter so what's that two and a half percent every quarter and it's not three years but the number of periods is now 12 quarters so we divide by four and we multiply by three to get that 74.35. Now, of course, you can go ahead and use your financial calculator to make that same computation. Now, notice what we've done here. In the previous slides, I went ahead and get out my financial calculator and showed you that. But here, I'm just showing you the steps so that uh, this is probably a little bit more efficient. So get out your financial calculator and go ahead and work through the inputs. And notice we have for the BA2+, plus, and we also have for the HP12C. And here, let me, let me do this for you. What we're doing is we're gonna go back to this equation here, where am I? This equation here, present value, is just discounted future value, and we're making a slight adjustment here if we wanna do it, oh man, I don't wanna say this, the long way math, but let's go ahead and do it with the financial calculator. So we need to make a slight adjustment. So notice the slight adjustment is that the N is not three, and that the I slash Y is not 10, the N is now 12, and the I slash Y is now two and a half. And so you'll get that same, here, let me go back here, you'll get that 74.35, whether you use the time value factor formula or the slight adjustment for the, uh, for the financial calculator. Now, let me give you a piece of advice here. Lots of students want to say something like, wait a minute, Jim, I can hit my P slash Y button, my payments per year, and I can, I can change that to four. And, and yes, you can. You can solve that by changing that uh, setting on your calculator. But my concern is that if you do it, then you may forget to change it back to P slash Y equals one um, for the next problem. Now there are exceptions to my rule. So I think it's, and we think that it's much more efficient to go ahead and make the slight adjustment here. Make N 12 and make I two and a half and you get the 7435. Now I know that some of you are way smarter than I am and you can just look at this equation right here and you can say, no, I'm gonna use this formula. So go ahead and use that one. Remember, the CFA Institute doesn't really care how you obtain the answer as long as it's your answer and not your neighbor's answer, of course. The, um, so do it this way or do it that way. Uh, how about we do another quick one? 50,000, 12-year loan, interest rate of 1% per month. All right, so we're going to go out 12 times 12. So there we go, 144 periods, right? Those are months. We're taking out this loan, $50,000 today, and we're being charged 1% per month. So what is that future value? So there we go. We're gonna go ahead and raise the 1.01, right, to the 144. So there we get $209,530. Whoops, I went ahead too quickly. 
So those of you who are super quick with your brains, you can use it, do it that way, or you can use the inputs here. And so note, we're making the slight adjustment again. N is now 144 and I is one. So you get the 209530, whether you use either calculator or whether you use this equation back here. Ah, I gave you this definition of annuity just a few moments ago, right? An annuity is a series of consecutive equal cash flows. And of course, it's finite, meaning that it occurs uh, uh, over a fixed period, like 10 years or 100 years, all with the same value. Your calculator assumes that when you hit the PMT button, that it is an ordinary annuity. So let me give you that definition right off the bat here. Ordinary annuity is a series of consecutive equal payments that begin one year from today or one period from today. Uh, we all are probably familiar with our mortgage payment. What do we know? We say pay to the order of mortgage banker $1,000 a month. We do that every month for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Annuity due, on the other hand, is a series of consecutive equal payments, but the first payment is due, D-U-E, it's due today. Insurance premiums, of course. You know, I, I make my uh, car pre premiums uh, quarterly, and so my uh, my bill is due, my, my year is due in November, so on November 1st, I make a quarterly payment. And then I do it again, you know, over the next time periods. And so it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like prepaid insurance for that, uh, for that time period. So annuity due is relevant for insurance premiums. Now, of course, we need to make some slight adjustments to the present value and future value of the ordinary annuity, given our time value of money, time value factor equations that we've become familiar with through this slide deck. And so here we are, and you guys can memorize this if you want, or you can just use your financial calculator, which I'm guessing most of you will. Now the present value and future value of the annuity due is a little bit more complex so notice what we have to do here. We need to multiply, here, let me go back here. We need to take those two equations and multiply them by one plus the interest rate. And the reason that we do that is, I'm gonna do this here with my hands. So here's, here's an annuity, an ordinary annuity, right? So one, two, three, four. So let's suppose that's four years, right? So in year one, two, three, four. Can you guys see that or is that backwards? How about if I had to go like this? Does that help? How about if I go like that? I don't know what helps. But anyway, you should get my point of the timeline, right? But an annuity due, the payments are due like this, right? <laughs> or should I go like that? Or should I go like that? I don't know. So if I go like this, so what we need to do is compound that out one more time. Or, or what you can do is you can, here, let me skip ahead. Let me skip ahead. Or you can change your calculator mode. So let's do this problem here. All right, you ready? Sorry, I was skimming through there quickly. I hope I didn't give anybody a migraine. So here we go. Dave buys an annuity, regular series of payments, $200 per year, 15 years. He will receive equal payments at the beginning of every year. Ah, so what premium should Maxwell be willing to pay for this annuity, assuming 13 and a half percent? All right, so there's the key. And this is crucial. I do this to students all the time on my exams. I don't ever say, hey, it's an ordinary annuity or hey, it's an annuity due. I couch the question stem in the following manner. I say, suppose we have a series of regular payments that begin one year from today. Ah, that's the ordinary annuity. Or that begin today. Ah, that's the signal for the annuity due. So be prepared to try to solve that problem uh, on your level one exam. So here we go. Method one, using the formula, we get 1430. Using the calculator, ah, here we go. Let's go ahead and switch the calculator from end 
mode, which is the default and which our calculators have been set as such, um, set it to beginning mode. And so those of you who have the BA2+, plus, you need to use your second function. So do your second begin and then second set. So look at your second set is up under the enter button until the begin displays. And then you need to do second quit. So you need to do your second, 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 second. So this one here takes a few moments for you to get it. Uh, you guys that have this wonderful calculator here just look up uh, under the is it the seven and the eight look up under the seven and the eight and yours is just a simple uh, blue function to set to the begin mode so if you do that then your inputs are exactly like they were in the past and you go ahead and you get that 1430 so 1430 whether you use the time value of money factor formula adjusted for the annuity and then adjusted for the annuity due or you take the simple approach and set your calculator to begin mode now let's take a deep breath are you ready for this let me warn you when you change this to begin mode and you solve this problem on the exam immediately set it back to the end mode so that you don't uh solve the next series of problems in the annuity due mode, which will inevitably give you the incorrect answer, which you inevitably know in these multiple choice questions will be one of your answer choices. Now we've done timelines here. I've done these. I've shown you a couple here as a physical illustration. And so my advice is to go ahead and construct a timeline, no matter what time value of money problem that you're being asked to solve, because it helps you visualize the cash flows. What you can then do is you can see regular amounts. You can see them as annuities, but if they have unequal amounts, you can see them as a series of one time lump sum future values. And so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a visualization here. Notice the LOS just asks us to demonstrate this. So let's suppose that we have $100 in period one, 150 in period two, 250 in period three, 300 in period four, 250 in period five. Assuming that the interest rate is 5% present value. Now remember, this LOS doesn't ask us to calculate. This LOS just asks us to demonstrate. Now, of course, at some future reading, we're going to have to calculate a series of consecutive unequal cash flows, their present value, but not today. So there's the, uh, there's the timeline, right? Zero is time period today. Then there's the one, two, three, four, five. And so in order to compute those present values, all we're going to do is just discount them back using the regular old time value factor. And we get, uh, well, we get those intermediate answers and then we get 889. I know I spend through those quickly, but go ahead and feel free to stop the slide deck if you want to go ahead and do the math. I will say this, that in a future reading, we will show you how to use your, are you ready for this? Your cash flow button in order to solve for present value. But for now, I think we've done enough for this reading and this uh, satisfies the LOS, that final one of demonstrate the use of the timeline. So at the end of every slide deck, I like to give candidates kind of my thoughts about which ones that I think are more important. And remember, my opinion is just my opinion. Uh, the Institute can ask questions based on any LOS so my advice to my student candidates is to just know it all and, uh, and, uh, and be on with your life. That's really what I say. But here, clearly, that second one is super important. Explain the components of an interest rate. I love that second one because that's going to give you a really super foundation as we move through uh, these readings in level one, because we're going to continually talk about liquidity and maturity and opportunity costs. So I think that's a super important one. And then, of course, make sure you are familiar with the steps leading to uh, calculator outputs.